If you thought you were here for anything else, you can uh, kind of quietly sneak out the door. Um, my name is James McLean from National Cancer Institute, moderating today. Um, I don't have a formal presentation today, so most of our time is going to be spent uh, uh, listening to our full panel here, and then uh, any time for interaction and questions as we go. Uh, throughout the course of the day, we're going to go ahead and take uh, questions following each, pres each presentation, because the presentations are relatively diverse, and we'd like to stay somewhat focused on the, on, on the topic as we go. Um, and then any additional time we have at the end, we can open up for uh, further or general or, or, or more questions uh, as we move along. Some fun little feedback there. Okay. Um, so uh, a, couple, a couple of points, just a handful of points I'd like to make before we start. Uh, I think the, the panel is, is really terrific and covers a diversity of areas. And there are areas that I think are of uh, significant interest to National Cancer Institute and NIH in general. Uh, I think uh, one of our biggest problems as we go forward is trying to work towards an ability to understand and make sense of data. I don't think research is going to progress exactly the same way as it always has. I think we're going to move away from a centralized conceptual model and more towards a decentralized model, where the centralized model has got a lot of value to us in terms of standardization, in terms of protocol consistency, but it limits our scope, our sample size, our generalizability. And as we move out and start thinking about more of a decentralized model, we might optimize and maximize for scale and uh, ge geographic diversity and socio-demographic diversity as we move forward. Um, can anybody hear me out there? Oh, good. All right. Excellent. Um, beyond that, I think one of the biggest things we lack, we've got a great development ecosystem around tools and technology development. In terms of making that useful for research or clinical management, I think we have a lack of back-end architecture for harnessing, managing, and making sense of that information. Uh, so it's not enough, really, to build a new technology and a great system. Meaningful use is not meaningful deployment, in my mind. This is not to say that we're going to build terrific products and we're going to be able to deploy them and get them to a consumer, get them to a patient, get them uh, embedded within a health system. But what we have to do in the end is ultimately get that data back and be able to act on it in some, some meaningful way. And for research, that might be an ability to aggregate that data and, and make meaningful analyses of it. Uh, for clinical trials or other clinical monitoring or management, it would be a different endpoint. But regardless, we still need to work more as we go forward, not only developing tools and technology, but also looking towards where that technology and data leads. So uh, without really uh, pontificating any more up here, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first speaker. So first up, we're going to have uh, Dr. Brandon Alward from Cincinnati Children's Hospital uh, Medical Center. And he's going to be presenting on utilizing objective assessment data for MIM Health Technologies for improving pediatric migraine care. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here today. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm currently at Cincinnati Children's and completing uh, two fellowships. One's uh, an NIH G32 fellowship, and the other one's in uh, Quality Scholars Program in Healthcare Transformation. And today I want to present some information about using technology that uh, combines with clinical recommendations for assessment and how we can use these with uh, using data analytics to improve chronic illness care um, and, and promote more effective management. And I'm going to be particularly talking today about pediatric migraine, which is one of the five most prevalent chronic uh, childhood disorders. Many of you have probably heard of a child or an adolescent experiencing a headache, or even as an adult you might have experienced a headache. But it results in a, number, a significant number of school absences. And when we talk about... Uh, headaches in children and adolescents, we are talking about, for example, at Cincinnati Children's, we see about 800 to 900 new patients a year. And these are uh, patients coming to, to care at Cincinnati Children's are not necessarily the ones that might be experiencing a headache once a month or um, on average, they're typically experiencing about 14 to 15 per month. 
And when we look at the impact on quality of life of pediatric migraine compared to other conditions, we're seeing similar uh, results as it relates to pediatric cancer, heart disease, rheumatic disease, and other chronic illness groups. And it has a significant burden on uh, economic burden with about $36 billion uh, in the U.S. are estimated uh, costs associated with migraine. And that's across childhood, adolescence, and into adulthood. To address and, and more effectively manage pediatric migraine, there's a number of recommendations. These can include preventative meds or abortive meds such as Aleve where they're recommended to take um, only up to about three times a week. This can include recommendations around daily fluid intake, which is about 64 to 96 ounces per day. Sleep recommendations, uh, about eight to 10 hours per night, uh, including a balanced diet that includes green leafy vegetables and ensuring that they're not skipping meals. And also recommendations around exercise at least 30 minutes a day for about five days a week. The assessment of pain can be done in a number of different ways. This can be used based on event-based, so when they're experiencing a headache, or at fixed intervals using methodologies such as momentary assessment. It can include things like electronic diaries or paper diaries. It can be from teachers or parents just observing kind of the behavior of the child, and there's many parents that come to our clinic and they say, I can tell when my child is having a migraine based on how their, the features look in their face or just how they're acting, they're more withdrawn. We can also look at the impact of pain on areas such as functional disability, ability to go to school, ability to do chores at home, engage in normal activities, uh, after school curricular activities, things like that. And we also look at one other important component when we're looking at pediatric migraine is their adherence to those recommendations that I mentioned before because we have identified that these are important components in our toolbox for effective management with pediatric migraine. When we think about monitoring behaviors and symptoms, there's the report that you get in the clinic, which maybe the patient comes in and meets with the provider for about 30 minutes, and that's maybe an optimal um, scenario. But then we might recommend that they come back about in about three months. So they're spending about 131,000 minutes outside the clinic setting, which is about is a very small percentage of time in the clinic, and as you can see here, to illustrate a significant portion of time outside the clinic setting. So in that 30 minute visit, the ability to capture what happened over the last three months might be very limited, and we might be limited on summary information. So it might be a question such as, how has your pain been? Based on that response, we might change our intervention. But we also have to take into account that that response might be a factor of how they're feeling today. So if they're having pretty significant pain today, they're gonna to report their pain's been pretty bad over the last three months. But it might have just been today and yesterday were, were severe pain, they're experiencing severe pain versus over the last three months. Therefore, it's important to utilize methods that can look at the day-to-day -day variation in something such as pain. And that's where mobile health technology comes into play. As part of this, uh, I want to present something, uh, an app called iMigraine, which we've developed to better assess and understand the daily variation in migraine, uh, not only severity, but the characteristics that are associated with the pain. This is part of a larger study called the Impact of Migraine Study, or iMigraine Study, that was funded by the Migraine Research Foundation. And this application allows us to look at things such as pain occurrence and not occurrence, but also assess some of these other recommendations that are part of effective clinical management for migraine. So this could be things like mood, sleep, and some of those dietary recommendations. And from this data, we can get an understanding of some of the temporal and dynamic relationships between some of these variables. So it, for a particular individual, it might be that yesterday's lack of sleep might be predicting today's uh, migraine but the triggers for each individual might be different. So we're able to assess kind of the within variability for that individual patient and provide recommendations that are tailored to that individual rather than making a blanket recommendation. There are many health apps out there. And as you've seen in some of the recent releases about various studies, many of them might not be based on clinical recommendations or haven't been evaluated to determine their effectiveness. The current app that I'm talking about today incorporated the NIH common data elements to 
assess migraine in, in children and adolescents. The common data elements are to standardize data collection across sites and improve data quality and promote data sharing. The assessment of headache in children includes a number of factors. So this might be things around a pain severity rating, uh, pain characteristics such as is it on one side of the head, both sides of the head, uh, temporal, um, things like that, or are they experiencing uh, aura, auras such as sensitivity to light, sound, and other kind of features. But these are the standard recommendations for assessments uh, based on NINDS common data elements for assessing migraine in children and adolescents. And today I want to present a case example so you can get an illustration about the information that we can gather from the iMigraine application. Starting with a 13-year-old female who had a history of daily chronic headache for about four years. And these symptoms when she presented to clinic were worsening over the last three months and resulted in a number of school days missed over the last semester, about 11 days. On a standardized questionnaire assessing functional disability, she reported moderate to severe disability. And there's a family history of migraine and fibromyalgia. Based on the presentation to clinic, there was a multi-component treatment uh, uh, intervention developed. That included the biobehavioral education, so information about the importance of sleep, uh, adherence to preventative meds, uh, things about the healthy diet, et cetera. And we were able to take the information that she uh, inputted into the iMigraine application and, and allow that to help guide our intervention. So if we were to take a look at the, uh, taking a look at the calendar that she presented, you can see there's a number of, uh, she's having the daily pain severity. These are pain severity ratings, zero to 10, 10 being worse pain, zero being no pain at all. And as you can see, there's um, some variability in her reports. Now, if we were just to present this at clinic, it might be hard to, we might make an eyeball interpretation about the symptoms. And we might pick out a day and might say that that day was worse. But one of the things that's important to appreciate here is that variation. And when we think about daily variability, there might, there's always gonna be kind of that fluctuations in ratings. So whether it is pain, um, blood glucose ratings, um, or even if, you, I mean, taking it outside the healthcare setting, if you go into something about how many passing yards did RG3 have, um, there's gonna be variability game to game with those kind of numbers. But in order to appreciate, we have to understand whether that these are just normal variation or what we call special cause variation. Normal variation is gonna be the ups and downs that you'd expect just to reflect the kind of given process. But special variation would be something might be going on in the system or with that individual patient that would give us a better indicator, and more uh, precise indicator about whether or not to change the treatment regimen. And so with this application, we've developed data analytics to better understand this variation using something called a st statistical process control chart. What, is, what this kind of control chart does is it, it maps the variation over time. So starting with taking that calendar that I presented earlier, starting with day one, going to day 24, we can see that variability plotted on this graph. And it starts to give us some appreciation of what is significant variation versus normal ups and down variation. And when you look at this chart, there's a couple of different lines I want you to pay attention to. We have the average pain severity rating, which is that solid line in the middle. And so a patient might come in and say, my average rating of pain was a four and a half. But take into account that two patients can come in with average pain ratings of four and a half but have completely different clinical presentations. And the picture that we would present over a month we, could be completely different. So here, appreciating that variability, we also take into account a number of, of factors. We have what we call a UCL, which is an upper control limit, and an LCL, which is a lower control limit. Think about it like a normal distribution. And those would represent about three standard deviations off that mean. So we look at points outside those lines, and that would report significant variation, which might give us an important clinical indicator. So on day 11 here, we might ask questions to the patient about more in-depth questions about what were they doing that day and, and, and things like that. But there's also things that we look at that also show special cause variation. As you can see here, counting those dots that are above that mean, we have eight points above the mean, which would based on statistical process control would represent significant variation. So this is a point where for this particular patient was experiencing 
pain that would be above and beyond just normal ups and downs of their day-to-day -day pain. What we also see is that that pain starts to decrease after day 18 to 24, showing a reduction below the mean of what we would expect and variation, maybe possibly showing the effectiveness of our clinical intervention for care. Now this presents a way that we can look at variation in pain severity, but there are a number of other ways that you can look at variation as it relates to informing care. For example, we might be looking at days between events. Are they experiencing them every day or are they starting to become less frequent? The daily duration, if they're lasting an hour versus two hours versus three hours. And also look at the variation to, uh, to some of those daily factors that are recommendations, so daily fluid intake, uh, daily uh, daily sleep, daily exercise, and we can graph those and look at the variability as it relates to their clinical outcomes. In addition to just looking at pain severity, we're currently engaging in a study that allows us to look at some of these other factors using mobile health technology. For example, using electronic monitors on their prophylactic medication, as well as the Zio sleep system to assess, more objectively assess day-to-day -day variation in sleep quality and duration. In summary, mobile health technology has the ability to allow us for enhanced assessment of some of this day-to-day -day variation outside the clinic setting, given the large percent of time they're spending out that, outside the clinic setting. And this allows us to have a better appreciation for designing our interventions, as one of the important points is that our interventions are only good as the assessment that underlies it. And if we're relying on summary statistics, we might be missing the boat as far as guiding our intervention, we might be making treatment changes when, it, in fact, there was just normal variation going on in the process. And so quality improvement science can allow us to understand that variation and, and start to separate what is just the normal ups and downs in something such as pain severity versus something that would represent significant cause variation and would be a tool for guiding a clinical decision. This can allow us to improve the delivery of services at the point of care. In our particular app, that information is fed through a portal and we're able to, in real time, look at the variation in symptoms. And that can report whether or not they might be, rather than coming back in three months, having them come back sooner because there's significant variation in their symptoms. If we put this all together, what we see here is we're taking mobile health technology, combining with quality improvement science to use data analytics to understand the rich data that we get from technology, integrating it within a healthcare record, and providing training to providers around understanding this variation to inform care. Putting this in full circle, this kind of model can be applied to a number of different chronic illness conditions using a variety of different technologies with the ultimate goal of proving the outcomes for children and adolescents as well as adults. This model can, again, be applied to adults as well. I'd like to thank a lot of my collaborators for this project, and we'll open it up to questions. So if you have a, if you have a question, you can just go ahead and step to the microphone. Great presentation. Is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, what is the uh, back-end architecture for the data once it's collected by the mobile device? Is it shareable across other folks that might want to access that information? The way that it's been set up currently is there is graphs within the app that the patient can start to understand, and, and it's presented similar to how I presented it here. And so parents and their, uh, their child can start to look at that and start to become kind of uh, scientists of their own care and to understand what might be triggers. But then it's also fed into a portal where researchers and clinicians have access to that data as well. My question is, how do you build evidence-based research? How do you gather evidence saying that this mobile technology is actually effective in saying what it is saying? In, in the sense that, is there any validity for these studies? And how, how do we go about doing that? That is the next step in our investigation. We started with an application to, uh, through an iterative process that uses these NIH common data elements to assess migraine. And based on feedback from children and adolescents, continue to refine the app 
which then, so first it started out as more of a research tool, and now it's more, moving more towards a clinical tool. Well, there, then we'll be able to do a head-to-head -head comparison of treatment based on using this kind of technology and quality improvement science versus those that don't have access to the, the technology or are not using the technology and understand its impact on management of migraine. Great presentation. Um, I'm Patty Clark from the University of Michigan. Um, my question is, were you, and I may have missed this, were you able to integrate the um, data that you um, gather into your electronic medical record for clinicians, or what kind of platform are they able to see this information on? This was a separate platform, but the ultimate goal is to build it into, uh, into our ER. We are on the EPIC system. Um, one of the ways to do that is that uh, in our clinical care, for example, I mentioned the functional disability inventory. In our uh, division, we have kiosks when patients come into the clinic setting, and they are reporting their disability on that, and that's fed into the electronic medical record. The next step would be integrating not only the functional disability ratings that we get, but also the information from the app within that record as well. So some of the components are integrated within the medical record. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to applaud your uh, willingness to take the time to really design a longitudinal study where you can look at these trends over time. My question relates to actually the data collection because uh, uh, from your description, it seems as if quite a bit of this data, while gathered electronically, is still very dependent upon self-report uh, by the patient themselves. Could you explain what the mix is and maybe some elaboration on the non-self-report uh, information that is gathered in the study? Thank you. The particular app for migraine is based on self-report. The other components that I mentioned, for example, adherence to prophylactic medication, we're starting to use electronic monitors, um, because especially within adherence and self-management, we know that self-report can be biased and they tend to report that they're uh, taking their medication every day. And, and that's an important question when you start to look at assessment about how you're asking that question as a clinician to patients. Rather than asking, did you take your medication or not, most likely they're going to say yes, versus asking how many times over the last week or two weeks did you take, miss your medication. We're also using factors such as zeal to more objectively assess sleep in the population as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, so, somewhat real quickly related to this is uh, what is the, what amount of missing data do you get since you're dealing with an adolescent population and uh, they may not be quite as concerned about reporting as we might like them to be? Well, we built in is we built in a kind of a feedback loop for them so that we're to, to try to minimize missing data. If we do see that there's a uh, number of days going where they're not reporting either presence or absence of migraine, we're providing push notifications for them, and we also have the ability to do FaceTime notifications just to troubleshoot and check in on their care. This particular study was more on the, the research end, and we're looking to scale up. In the particular study, we had about 45 participants uh, that we were able to gather their data for 45 days, and we had on average, I think the average was about 37 days that we have of reporting out of that 45 days. Um, but there is going to be factors associated with missing data, and the data analytics can take into account that missing data when it looks at the variability. Hi, Steve Bombasari, the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Um, so two interrelated-ish questions. Do you have any plans to um, develop some kind of adaptive technology on the baseline so that it can take into account current clinical changes in the, in the patient's status? And sort of related to that, is there ways of ultimately converging it so that the pain, average pain levels are zero? When you, when there, the two questions there. First, when we start to um, look at pain levels of zero, that's where we have switched to not looking at variation, but days between events. Thinking about, for example, a serious safety event within a hospital, those don't typically happen every day. Those kind of analytics would use a different type of control chart, and they look for days in between events. Um, and then the, the other question was? Just adapt. How, how do you plan to adapt the algorithms that as you're improving patients' clinical statuses, you're holding yourself to a higher bar for yeah. your therapy results? The graph that I presented, typically what you, you would do is do a baseline assessment 
and look at variability there. Then based on if you're doing an intervention, you, there's decision rules based on theory that you'd maybe change that mean uh, line, and then your variability is around that adjusted line if you started to make a change to the treatment regimen. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. All right, excellent presentation, excellent discussion. Next up is uh, Michael Bass from Northwestern University, who will be presenting on a computer adaptive testing approach to patient reported outcomes for mobile devices. Okay, thank you. Throughout this summit, there's been a lot of discussion regarding data capture with electronic devices. I'd like to present another form of data that can be captured through mHealth solutions that can help improve clinical care, that being patient-reported outcomes. There are three points that I'd like to make during this presentation. What are patient-reported outcomes? What is computer-adaptive testing? Where can you find more information, where you can find more information regarding these concepts, and then finally a use case of how an mHealth solution can be created using this information. To begin with, what are patient reported outcomes? According to the FDA, this is the definition of a patient reported outcome. The only information I would like to add to this is that we're talking about qualitative type of data compared to clinical data, which typically is um, more quantitative. The other point I'd like to make is that I think there's a synergy between patient-reported outcomes and mobile health technology compared to how it was usually being captured with their paper and pencil or web-based surveys. I mean, people have their mobile device. They like to hold it and use it, and I think they feel comfortable entering patient reported data within these type of devices. As an example, let's look at uh, let's look at physical functioning. Here are pictures of different levels or abilities of physical functioning, starting from bedridden to high performing athletes. Everyone falls somewhere within the continuum of this level. So the question becomes is how do we bec how do we take these qualitative ideas and create a quantitative value for this? What we use is a concept of item banking where we take large groups of items associated with this domain and put them and calibrate them within this continuum. So we have items such for high level um, activities such as running five miles down to lower activities such as, or very little activities, not being able to get out of bed. So now that we have the units that we're going to use for measurement, we have to make a, we can make a decision. We can have two types of measurement approaches. We could take a static approach and a dynamic approach. What I mean by static approach and is that in our example, we have a physical functioning instrument or survey that has 10 items. Everyone who will be taking this assessment will be receiving the exact same 10 items. In this model, we can cover the continuum, but what we end up with is um, low precision because we only have 10 data points that have been calibrated to compare a person's ability. For example, in this case, physical functioning. The other approach would be a dynamic approach where we would use a whole bank to 120 items in this case along the continuum. And at this point, we can then tailor the items or pick the next item that would be more associated with the person's ability with the information that has been provided. Again, we're only going to be administering 10 items, but the items will be different and they will be more tailored to the level of ability that we have been calculated at that point in time. With this approach, we can cover the same range, but receive a higher 
accurate or a higher precision of our calculations. And these are sort of the basics of computer adaptive testing. This approach has been around for a while. It's been used mostly in the educational industry for computer, um, for standardized testing, such as LSATs, MCATs. Uh, what we have done is really taken this algorithm, this concept, and applied it to patient reported outcomes. Some of the characteristics of this are you need a large bank of items in order to get precise readings. After each participant's answer, you re-estimate the calculation to, to find where you are at that point, and you continue this process to find the next best item that matches that ability. And you continue this process until a stopping rule has been achieved, whether it be a standard error or a maximum amount of items to reduce patient burden. The only other point I'd like to mention that um, this isn't a simple branching or a state engine type of process. It's an algorithm that is recalculated or a functional approach to um, calculating this after each point. So it's a very iterative process. Now that we've covered, oops, sorry. Now that we've covered some of the basics ideas of patient reported outcomes and computer dev testing. I'd like to point out two places for more information regarding this. Inform this. Um, Promise at nihpromise.org was a, um, a roadmap initiative. It's, I think it's in the almost finishing up the second year or second recycle of um, grant period where you can find out more information about what PROs are available that have been developed, how to use them, um, questions about that concept. In terms of CAT, and it's associated with the Promise Network, is a software that was written called Assessment Center. Assessment Center is software that's really targeting the researcher in the sense that it's a turnkey solution for researchers to set up studies, define protocols, um, select instruments, add their own instruments, administer it to participants, and collect data. So it's really a, a one-stop shopping approach to collecting patient-reported outcomes and using computer adaptive testing. That works for research, but what about, it, it's really not maybe the best fit for clinical care or a clinical um, application. So with that in mind, what we've started to develop is an API model that will provide maybe more matched clinical needs. And as an example, I'd like to go through a walkthrough in a second. But the use case I'd like to try to present is uh, a patient who may have a chronic condition which requires them to take maybe a certain type of Medicaid. Maybe it's high cholesterol, blood pressure, or maybe a cancer patient who's on chemotherapy who is routinely um, taking a medication and routinely has to either get blood work or some type of test to determine if the um, medication is, is working. Um, in this situation, what happens if we would want to supplement this with some type of social cycle, so, social, psychosocial panel such as depression, fatigue, anxiety, to see if that is to get a better clinical treatment? We can do that by using this API model. And the data flow of an application like this may look something like this. Um, when the patient would come in, for, before the patient would come in for their visit, they would contact the provider. And the provider would place an order for this, I'll call it the emotional health panel. It would go to the electronic medical record. The electronic medical record then would communicate to the API, the assessment center API. This could also trigger a reminder to a uh, mHealth solution type of uh, an application, whether that application is a third-party application or part of an app, a patient-facing app from the electronic medical record, they would receive some type of notification. This notification then can communicate with assessment center, the APIs, to administer the uh, surveys in an adaptive approach using CAT to um, record the level of that ability that we're trying to measure, whether depression, fatigue, anxiety. Once the stopping rule has been hit, 
the scores can be re, um, can be retrieved from the API and then incorporated back into the electronic medical record so that when the patient visits the clinician, they can read and view the uh, patient reported outcome alongside the clinical data to be have a more well informed decision and provide care. Um, I'm going to now talk more about the API and the implementations of the APIs. Um, but before that, I just wanted to, these are the type of questions that can be used to answer the, for the APIs can be used to answer. You know, what instruments are available out there to be incorporated into mHealth solutions? How does a participant place an order to use the API? How does the actual communication between the API take place? And how do you get scores? Um, the first couple of informa the first information I'd like to make is general comments, more of the implementation of what needs to be done with the API. Um, they all use basic authentication to communicate with to who the person is. Um, all the keys, the person or the um, response to the items, use unique identifiers for tracking. The API has a versioning control based on, or versioning based on year and month of when they were developed. And like most APIs, RESTful APIs now, they can either return um, responses in either JSON or XML formatting. Um, I wanted to just take my hands off to Twilio. Um, Twilio is an API model that we have used in um, our IVR system for assessment center. And when going about developing our APIs, I found Twilio very easy to use as a developer and understand, and so I was trying to make ours as easy to use. So some of these concepts or naming conventions are really based off of what we have truly used in Twilio. Another example of the type of calls or the format of the calls, the request, would look like this, where there's first the server, assessmentcenter.net, the application, the API application called AC underscore API, the versioning of which version of the API, then the resource, then either the um, format or the specific form that you are interested in. So this is how the request would look. Um, the other part I wanted to talk about at an assessment center, when someone is ready to start using this and trying to implement this in an M house solution, we provide documentation Twofold. One, what the request would look like in either a scripted type language of a JavaScript or a coded based compiled code C sharp, and we'll add more information to that, as well as the type of formats that come back from the API so that a developer can see what the format is and then determine what type of UI to build based off of these requests. Um, before using the APIs, we request people give us some basic information so we can help tell people when new versions come out and improve the information. By filling out a small form and terms and conditions of the promise instrument, we'll send a token back, a username and token back with an activation, and then you can start using that for your basic authentication to the API. Uh, again, just to reiterate the format, the request response format. Um, in red is the request, and in black are the formats of the responses. I won't go into the details. I don't know how many people are interested in the coding aspect of that, but I'll continue next with um, the three APIs that were mentioned in the use case. So in the bottom left, we see the actual order placement. Here you would make a call to the assessments resource of the API. Um, and then you would pass in, in the URL the specific form or instrument you wanted to administer, whether it be the anxiety or fatigue. What would come back would be a unique identifier token, the OID, which would be that person's specific token for further requests to the API during the administration process. From the assessments request, we go to the actual administration, the CAD administration of the form that was, that was requested. In this case, you would use that token and pass it to the participant uh, resource of the API. And this is an iterative process. You would then post back responses to the questions until a stopping rule had been achieved. At this point, the 
information coming back to the response would be the date finished of when the assessment, the stopping rule has been achieved, as well as the scores um, related to that assessment, the thetas and the standard errors of the assessment. Um, I'd like to thank a few people who were early adopters helping beta test and, and create this, um, this system. Dennis Crane at Microsoft Research, he helped us develop, he contacted us and collaborated with us for a um, Windows uh, mobile device. Uh, Andrew Martin at Stanford, uh, even though it's not a mobile solution, REDCap is a data capture system which he had an interest in incorporating the promised cat information into the product. Uh, Gabe at Northwestern was interested more in a, uh, a uh, phone gap type of solution to the APIs. And Ming at Stanford, uh, I think, was interested in um, studying pain, and so he developed a mobile, an Android mobile application. Um, so the next steps. Right now, because this is an extension of Assessment Center, we house this platform on Northwestern servers. Um, in order to be really clinically relevant, we would have to migrate this to a cloud uh, installation. And privacy and security always have to be evaluated. I would, the last point I'd like to make about the privacy and security, this is a completely anonymous um, service. There is no PHI information traveling between our system or a ser our service. That it's not a data management. We do not, um, we want no private pub or PHI information so that we would like this to be able to um, host it in a cloud. And for that reason, we always have to consider the privacy and security and reevaluate that continuously to see how we're doing. Uh, with that, I'd like to conclude. Thank you very much. Excellent. Okay, uh, next up, um, we'll have uh, Jim Kwan from Randolph College. who will be presenting on assessing gate speed, step count, and step-to-step -step variability in natural environments using cellular phones. Well, hello everyone. My name is Jim Kwan. I'm a junior undergraduate student at Randolph College and I'll be talking about assessing gate speed, step counts, and classification of activities in natural environments using cellular phones. Okay, this work is a collaboration work between um, University of Nebraska Medical Center, Randolph College, and Northwestern University. So, cost of healthcare has never been higher. The United States currently spends about 16% of their GDP on healthcare related costs. And as popul mean population is getting older, mean population is getting older, the cost is bound to rise. May, uh, the people who are getting older are now are used to having technology, and many people, many are technologically adept and willing to pay money to may, may pay money to get it. So our goal is using people's on smartphones to collect healthy related data so you can deliver care. I'm sure you, most of us are carrying a smartphone around us. And like us, a lot of people carry this, their smartphone practically everywhere they go. And a lot of people actually feel naked when they don't have a smartphone on them. And the widespread of these inexpensive telecommunication technologies have enabled had made it possible for us to see whether people are doing what we ask them um, them to do like um, doing more exercise and also we can actually tell how different treatments is affecting patients uh, mobility and activity the data clearly suggests that traditional survey based measurements and and screening has um, well recognized limitations and it is our goal to use already, already available cell phones to collect long time data in a non invasive, robust, continuous, and near real time manner. 
We looked at a number of people from young, middle age, and old age in both laboratory and naturalistic settings. And we've collected um, accelerometer data while they're doing a variety of different activities. In 2010, UNMC had 55 community dwelling adults aging from 19 to 87 years old in both genders. And they, have been, um, they had them on, a, on the treadmill and they were walking five minutes of locomotion and each of the subject had four to 14 minutes, 14 different locomotions. And while they're walking or jogging, we videotaped their footsteps so we know exactly how many steps they walked and from the treadmill, we know exactly how fast they were going. And this summer, we had two UNMC research students perform day 10 different activities, such as walking on the track, going to the movie, and walking the stairs to classify five different activities, um, whether they have forgotten their phone, whether they're resting, whether they're doing an activity but not walking whether they're walking on the level ground or they're going up and down the stairs. And while they were performing these activities, we, they had this um, cell phone on them and also they were documenting what they were doing in a very um, precise activity log. So we know what they were doing in a minute by minute resolution. So the purpose of data gathering was to build a model to classify the five different activities that I mentioned above and to test the footfall counter and gait speed algorithm in both laboratory and naturalistic terrain. Uh, we have used half of the data to make the model and the other half to validate the model. The exciting thing is that even in this early stage of data, um, data collection, we have actually nice performance of a variety of different important health-related behaviors over peop of people over long periods of time. So first thing we do is when we take the raw accelerometer data, we process it through a band pass filter and data quality control system. And we classify it into active and inactive states using RMS values and threshold technique. This is, um, this is the, okay, on your left shows the activity log that the two UNMC students were taking. And you can see that they were sitting from 9.49 to 9.55, .59, and from 9.55 to 10.01, they were walking around. So we can actually see what they were doing in a minute-by-minute -minute resolution. And on your right, we actually have the activity classification algorithm applied to the same set of data. And you can see from 9.49, 9.55, they were inactive. They were sitting down. And from 9.55 to 10.01, um, they were active. They were walking around. This clearly shows how we can actually capture when they're active and inactive in very um, detailed manner. Um, furthermore, we actually take the inactive and active classification and go into some um, little more detailed classification. So first thing we want to know is that whether the, patient, whether the subject has the phone on them or not. And when, if they have the phone, whether they're resting or active. And if they're active, are they walking around, just they're active but not walking around, or they're climbing the stairs? And we do that through RMS values, the RMS ratio values, and also Fourier transformation. And this is the um, validation, validation results. Once again, this is, we use the half of data to make the model, and this is the other half that we use to validate the model. This um, has about, it's more than 2,500 minutes of um, validation um, results uh, out of that 243 minutes of forgotten phone states, 685 minutes of resting states, 1,565 minutes of active but not walking states, 35 minutes of level walking states, and uh, 152 minutes of climbing the stairs states. And out of, um, so for forgotten phone, out of 233 minutes, out of 234 minutes, we classified as forgotten phone. For resting, we classified 630 minutes out of 685 minutes, we classified it as, thing, uh, as resting. And we also classified it as a little bit of forgotten, a little bit of active but not walking state. For active but not walking state, 1,463 minutes out of 15, um, 1,563 minutes, we classified it as active but not walking. And we classified it as some of the active but not walking state into 
resting state, and level walking. Level walking state, 34 minutes out of 35 minutes. The climbing states, um, states 148 minutes out of 152 minutes. And as you can see on the bottom, the accuracy of that is for every state, it's over 90%. Also, when, you're, when the subject is walking on the level ground, we can tell whether they are, how many steps they walked and how fast they're walking. And those two um, data are really important for Really, um, really important for a healthcare perspective because 2020, 2010, uh, let's see, the Healthy People 2010 recommends that, recommendation says that everyone should walk 10,000 steps a day. And from a healthcare perspective, when a person walks slower than two miles per hour, we begin to worry about them. And as you can see, for treadmill in the laboratory setting, treadmill validation, um, we could predict their gait speed ranging from two miles per hour to four miles per hour with 86% accuracy and step counts of them with 91% um, accuracy. And for more naturalistic terrain, the two UNMC students on outdoor track, we could predict their speed range from two miles per hour to five miles per hour with 87% accuracy and their footfalls with 87% accuracy. So, to finish it off, we understand there are a number of issues that we need to work on. We'd like to get those accuracies up to 99%. Also, we'd like to unify the data with the location data so we can tell what the, life, um, the, the lifestyle of the subject in a more robust manner. We need, to, we need more experience in deploying this in a larger scale. We will need institutional or corporate partners we can work with so that we can scale this up and prove that this can be a valid way of looking at important behaviors in larger groups. With that, I'm going to finish. I'll thank you for all your attention, and thanks for, for all my um, hard work of my colleagues that they have put. Okay, again, we can go ahead and take questions in the microphone. Uh, one question to lead off from me, if I take the liberty, I guess. Sure. Um, were, was this a, a kind of a forced compliance of sorts of wearing the phone at the hip versus in your pocket, in your purse, wherever else, or was it more natural? Well, it was more natural. We actually had um, a study from the treadmill data, and we had the subject wearing phone on, your, on their left hand, right hand, their left hip, right hip, and left leg, right leg. And from there we found out that all the locations actually had pretty good accuracies, but the best one, the best result came the right hip. So as long as they had the phone on them, we could actually see the gate speed and footfalls. But if that's on their pocket, we could see the best results. Yes. Thanks for your presentation. Kristen Heron from Penn State. Um, one of my questions was about location. The other one is, how are you collecting the data from people regarding what they were actually doing? Um, my concern is it looks like sort of minute by minute you have people reporting on that, and you're, you're comparing against that and assuming that that's kind of accurate, which it may or may not be. Um, so I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about sort of what you're comparing this data to um, and how you're getting that information from people about what they're sort of, quote, unquote, really doing. Well, um, the activity data were collected by two of the UNMC research students, and their, it was their job to go out and do these activities and log them in a very detailed manner. So we can actually see that with, uh, I can actually say it's going to be a pretty accurate result of, of what they were doing minute by minute. Yes. Thank you. Hi. I'm Jamie Roberts from the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, and I, I see tremendous applications for this in studying movement disorders, and I'm wondering if you're thinking about applications of this sort of technology to looking at gait and movement freezing, for instance, in Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders um, in the future, and how you might see that. And I realize that, I, first of all, I need to commend you. You're an undergraduate student, and you just made an absolutely Excellent presentation, so congratulations on that. And so if this is a question. Uh, so if this is a question beyond y y what you can answer, that's fine. I understand that. I still think you did a great job. But, it, you know, again, I'm just interested in how you see this playing out in the future for, for movement disorders and other neurological disorders. 
Well, I think one of my colleagues, Dr. Bonasa, I can answer the question a lot better than I could. Okay, well, I see this is this has a lot, like, tremendous applications. You can see the variability in steps, the variability on, like, how, how long you're active, what's the average duration of your activity and inactivity, how frequent you're active, how frequent you're inactive. And I can definitely see that this can be applied to Parkinson's disease, um, Alzheimer's disease, and even bipolar disease. And I definitely see that's a possibility, and that's the future direction that we would like to take this into. One more question? Hi there, uh, uh, John Holden with uh, VA's Office of Research and Development. I, I, I would second the comments made previously about the, your presentation and the importance of this uh, area of investigation. Um, could you comment a little bit on how you uh, detected gait speed and whether or not you, uh, using similar algorithms, you might be able to detect additional uh, activities that would indicate compliance, for example, compliance with rehabilitation protocols, uh, those kinds of things, which are uh, important uh, objective measures of what are otherwise might be patient-reported outcomes. Thank you. Well, in terms of gait speed, we use um, Fourier transformation. So when a person is walking, they walk in a, like, a certain <coughs> footstep frequency. And through FFT, we can actually see what's the dominant frequency while they're walking. Through that, we can see the frequency of walking and with the time duration, see how fast they're walking and stride length, how fast they're walking, how many steps they walked. And the compliance with the um, location data. Could you say a little bit more about the question? I guess I just wondered if there were plans to use similar kinds of algorithms uh, to uh, detect additional activities that might uh, reveal more about, as an example, compliance with specific kinds of physical rehabilitation uh, prescriptions and the like. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely, that would be my short answer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and our final presentation is from Dr. Amy Papadopoulos from A-Frame Digital, who will be presenting on risk-based accelerometers successfully differentiate walking from other activities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. My name is Amy Papadopoulos. I'm from A-Frame Digital. And I'll be talking about an NIH-sponsored, uh, funded study called Continuous Fall Risk Monitoring System walking versus activities of daily living. Before I begin, I'd like to thank my two co-investigators, Nicholas Vivaldi, who's in the audience, <laughs> and Christine Silvers. I will begin by giving a little background about why we did this project, um, providing our hypothesis, going over briefly our study design and our methods, um, presenting our results, and then finishing up with some next steps and conclusions. So falls. Falls are the leading cause of accidental death in those over age 65, as well as the leading cause of injury-related visits to the emergency room. However, if somebody's fall risk can be identified as being high, interventions are possible, which might help reduce that risk. Interventions could include physical therapy, changes in medication, environmental or even behavioral changes. But fall risk can change over time. It can change slowly or it can change quickly as a result maybe of a recent change in medication, um, a illness, just a short illness. Um, and these changes can be missed um, with only periodic visits. So our question is, can we monitor for this on a more continual basis? Traditional methods of gait assessment or um, fall risk analysis are gait assessment, including things like the Berg balance scale, um, the Tinetti, or the timed up and go. Um, a gate laboratory, as you actually saw previously with photo cameras and force plates and, and sensors. Um, or maybe a body area network where sensors are placed at different portions of the body. And um, during these activities, the people are asked to do certain things like walk on a treadmill or maybe go, you know, walk on a track. Um, but there are issues with all of these methods. In some cases, like the gate laboratory, it's very expensive and it's in one place that the person has to go for the analysis. 
um, almost all of them represent only a short period in time where the person's doing specific activities. And um, in the body area network, which does give you more freedom, it isn't designed for extended wear. They usually work, you know, three, four hours at a time, and you can gather data during that time. So our goal was to develop an inexpensive, socially acceptable, portable, comfortable, real-time continuous monitor for fall risk. Which brings me to our hypothesis that a risk-based accelerometer in a watch form factor will be kept capable of recognizing changes in fall risk. So you may ask, why a watch form factor? And that's because we did some focus groups and we found out that elderly individuals will be willing to wear a watch. They wear a watch probably already. They've always worn a watch. It doesn't have a stigma attached with being a medical device. They're just wearing another watch, okay? And if people aren't willing to wear the device, then we won't be able to gather the data. So we were aiming for a risk-based device. Now, a few years ago, in another separate study, we were able to determine that if someone wore a risk-based device and walked on a treadmill, we could determine their risk of falling. We could differentiate the fallers from the non-fallers. But we want to do this 24-7 when they're going about their days. So that brings us to this study, which is can we distinguish when they're walking from when they're doing anything else? So to do this, we had our, our study design. We enrolled 30 participants in our, our IRB-approved study. The individuals were ambulatory. They lived in independent living settings. They were over the age of 65. They were English-speaking. And we did have the limitations that only seven could use a gate aid. We actually enrolled six with gate aids. And the idea was to kind of to gather preliminary data on that population, assuming it was going to be different than those without gate assistance. Um, we had our study sessions were four hours in length from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. We figured this would be an active part of the day. We figured it would probably involve lunch, meaning they either had to go somewhere for lunch or prepare a meal so that we would have some sort of activity. And we told them to do whatever they usually do in and around the facility that they lived in. Okay, we had people who went shopping. We had people that took walks. We had people that did all sorts of things. We did actually ask them, though, not to get in a car or a bus so that we wouldn't have to go too far away. Our data collection method was using a wireless monitor on the wrist. But at the same time, we videotaped them. So for four hours, we videotaped these individuals. The data from the watch, the watch which I'm wearing on, um, has a triaxial accelerometer. It gives um, one byte of data for each axis, and we were sampling at 125 samples per second. The range was plus or minus 8G. In order to synchronize this with the video, we had a button that we used on the watch to start and stop the testing. And this was actually videotaped, so we could compare the beginning of the monitoring with the videotape. We also asked that the person raise their arm over their head um, at the beginning of the study for a few seconds. And the reason is, as I'm wearing this watch, if my arm is down by my side, then it just so happens, based on the placement of the accelerometer, that um, if it's on my right arm, then the, um, the y-axis will show as 1G. Okay, but when I put my arm above my head, the y-axis will now be negative 1G. Interesting detail is if I'm wearing the watch on the other hand, it's switched. So this person was wearing the watch on their left arm, I mean, they were actually right-handed, and they raised the, uh, their arm above their head between sec seconds six and nine. A little detail, actually, when we did um, this data analysis originally, the first time we ran the test data, there were three participants who had horrible data and we couldn't figure out why. I went back and I realized they were left-handed and everybody else was right-handed. So we went and we um, you know, made a, a slight adjustment to actually change for, check for left right-handedness and uh, that fixed our problem. Um, so the video analysis was potentially, I think, the most time-consuming and difficult part of this project. We went and we analyzed every second of video data. And we noted the second in which they transitioned from sitting to standing. But we also went and we analyzed each activity. And we went further than just walking because we saw that this is a very rich data set, having people doing various activities. And so we wanted to know what their activities were so we could maybe go back and do more analysis later. So walking we looked at and we, we differentiated between pure walking when they were walking that didn't fit into any of the other categories. When they were walking holding onto a railing, 
walking carrying something, um, going upstairs, going downstairs, walking using a cane, or walking using a walker. These were all differentiated between. But there, as I said, any other activity that was more than a few seconds long that was identifiable as an activity was also separated out. So we had people in the, working in the kitchen, we had people doing laundry, we had people ironing, shining shoes, wrapping presents, um, eating, drinking, doing paperwork, working on a computer, all sorts of activities, and we noted every second of information. We also collected a few pieces of information that were very study related. For example, when they started the watch, when they stopped it, um, when they put their arm over their head and when they went down, this was all for synchronization purposes. Um, Any time that they were, um, if they had to go to the bathroom or something and <laughs> um, were off of camera, we, we noted that. And then um, which arm, again, that was part of our um, means of validating that the synchronization was correct. Then we also gathered, um, we went back and looked at the videos for 10, cents, 10 seconds of example walking. And um, I will explain why we did that later. But we basically just went and looked at the video for 10 seconds that they happened to be walking in a straight line, not carrying anything. OK, our first method, as mentioned before, was frequency analysis. It's pretty well established that the walking frequency range is 0 0.7 to 3 hertz. And so we use this analysis to differentiate the walking from the other activities. Um, and we, we had some parameters we changed, like the window size, the duration of walking, um, the type of walking. Sometimes we would, were looking at the pure walking. Sometimes we would look at you know, all walking but not stairs, things like that. And we looked at each axis differently, as well as the normalized axis. The problem with the frequency analysis, though, is ideally, we would like to be able to do some of this analysis on the watch, because we don't want to have to send back all that data to our server. So we're looking for ideas and ways of doing things that might be on the watch. So we came up with a bunch of, um, I guess, easier <laughs> uh, features that we could calculate. And this green line is an example of somebody's walking. And you can see that there are peaks and valleys. And so one of the things we did, for example, was wave characteristics, looking for peaks and the durations between them. But you also might notice that it's not perfectly clear all the time. So this is where that example walking came in. We actually went and we took the three seconds of example walking, and we moved it along the signal, calculating the correlation between those three seconds of known walking and what they were actually doing. And this is something that could be done on the watch. So when we moved this three seconds of known walking across the rest of that signal, we got something that looked like that. Much easier to identify the peaks and the durations. Um, so after that, we basically we had all these features, and we looked at each feature individually for how it would separate walking into not walking. And I'm kind of going to go over this quickly. Um, but one of the things we considered combining features in maybe a two-step method or in, in Euclidean space. Okay, So we did all of this analysis with only five of the participants. They were our training set. And we selected our features um, that we were going to use, the two that we were going to use, um, I'm not, the, so the results, you know, what happened when we did this. I'm going to talk about first, we did this with the five participants from the training set, and we did it for pure walking, okay? So when they were just, just when they were walking, and we, you know, determined all of our parameters and our features. Then we went back and we tested it on the remaining participants who didn't use a gate aid. And I have all of the various numbers here, but the ones I'm going to point out are that the frequency results for the test sets gave us an area under the curve of 0 0.933. So we were pretty happy with that. That, to us, means that, yes, you can use a risk-based device to differentiate walking from other activities. And this is a little bit controversial, because some of the literature says that that's not possible, or that it's just not worth doing. But they're going to wear it at the worst. So even if it's not perfect, it is doable. And then the next thing, this two-step results, that was our, our algorithm that doesn't use frequency analysis. And with that, we didn't do quite as good on the test yet, but we still got 0 0.896. And this indicates that it is possible as well. We might have to do some playing around, maybe send some of the data back to the, the server. But we should be able to do this, taking benefits of things that can be done on the watch. I also have the results here for all walking, including stairs. And quite frankly, they're not much different. They, they um, were very similar. Just for fun, we decided to go back and look at those individuals who did use gate, um, gate aids. We had three who used walkers and three who used canes. And um, the frequency analysis for them gave an AUC of 0.824, and the two-step was 0.793.
But we figured you know, these people may have different things about how they're walking, and so different features might be more useful. So we went back. Again, we didn't have a separate training set for this portion because we only had a few participants. But we went back and looked at those features. We looked at them separately. It actually turned out that the same features worked the best for both groups. So with those features and on these six individuals, you know, I got an area under the curve of 0 0.879, which I thought was, was pretty good. It definitely gives us some preliminary results that we can take further for a larger study on that population. I did as an, go back and try those features on the others, and it wasn't bad. It was you know, 0 0.849 for the, the test set. Not as good as the other one, but not horrible either. So our next step is actually selecting the algorithm for implementation on the watch. We do have a commercially available watch um, that does activity monitoring and things like that. But um, if we want to do this, then we need to know, basically we want to monitor it for um, fall risk, then we need to know they're walking. So we want to be very careful and actually, at the cost of sensitivity, have very high specificity. Okay, so we have to go and actually kind of relook at the features, determine which ones give us that. After that, we need to consider battery conservation techniques, possibly doing um, a lower sampling rate, okay, things like that. And then there's the other idea that maybe if we can do some of it on the watch, then we send portion of the data back to the server. So we're not streaming everything, but we're streaming portions that might be interesting. Okay. The other thing, as I mentioned before, this is a very rich data set that covers many different activities, not just walking. So we know that we have the ability to go back and do secondary data analysis on this. And um, the state of Virginia has actually funded the first one, which is analysis of activity level, where we want to be able to go and based on the activity data we're getting from the watch, um, determine if someone's being inactive, moderately active, or active. And um, we're doing this by actually comparing it to the met values associated with each activity. Um, other things are, you know, people are interested in whether or not they're standing or sitting, and believe it or not, that's harder than determining walking. <laughs> um, and so one of the things we want to look at is that stand-sit transition um, might help us um, improve in that area. And then just recognition of other activities that we happen to catch, and we might be able to go back and, and determine things. I think that was one of the previous questions. You know, can we figure out something about some of the other activities? And finally, the most important one for this study is we want to con conduct a larger fall risk study where we put the watch on many more individuals for a longer period of time, then use traditional gait analysis at the beginning end and a few times in the middle, and compare that to what the watch is telling us. Finally, my conclusions, um, a risk state based device can be used to distinguish walking from activity, other activities of daily living. And then while the frequency analysis gives the best results, other method, methods which can be done on the watch are also feasible. And finally, this research shows that the goal of making a continuous monitor from a watch form factor um, is feasible. Thank you very much. I'm Amy Papadopoulos. I work for A-Frame Digital. And if you have more questions that you can't get answered now, you can visit me at booth 314. Thank you. OK, we can have uh, time for a few questions if you'd like. Okay, excellent. Well, no specific questions. Um, I'm going to invite uh, anybody in the room to feel free to come on up, speak with any of the speakers you'd like. Uh, if we get pushed out by the next session coming in, we can move out to the hallway. Thank you very much.